Welcome to ETF Market Insights, a weekly show focusing on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes. And remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content and when we go live each Friday. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Welcome back to ETF Market Insights. I'm your host, Erin Allen with BMO ETFs. And on today's episode, we're going to be exploring volatility and some ways that investors can position their portfolio portfolios to really lower those ups and downs associated with the markets and help them sleep better at night. Before we do get started, a quick reminder that we're not providing any investment advice or recommendations today. Today's episode, like all of our episodes, is all about information and education for Canadian DIY investors. Joining me on today's episode is my colleague and friend, Richard Ho, Director of BMO ETF Distribution. Rich has over 19 years of industry experience. Um, and in his previous role, he served as Director of Equity Derivatives uh, and the Client Relationship Management Team at the TMX Montreal Exchange. Uh, here he oversaw the options market. He's a wealth of knowledge and I'm so excited to have him on the channel today. Welcome, Rich. First time on the channel? Yeah, happy to be here, Aaron. Oh, it's great to have you. I can't believe it's the first time. Hoping you can kick things off and sort of uh, set the stage with us for us today with a high level look at our house views here at BMO. Sure thing, Aaron. Happy to share some insights from our house view. So first, let's start off with asset mix. So when it comes to asset mix, we always have to decide between where to allocate money to equities or fixed income. So on the fixed income side of things, uh, we are overweight fixed income versus cash. And that's because we're expecting that the U.S. Fed and also the Bank of Canada to continue easing their interest rate policies for the remainder of the year, which is something that investors, the market is expecting. And because of this, fixed income traders are looking for longer bond durations. So bond traders are starting to position for this potential outcome. Now, when it comes to the equity side of things, we are neutral on equities and we are taking a more conservative, cautious approach due to higher valuation multiples. And we continue to like equity names in the US and slightly underweight Canada. And now for precious metals, we continue to like gold as a hedge against potential market risk. So we think that gold can continue to shine. And also we see that central banks are adding more gold to their reserves. And this can prove some good tailwind for gold prices. So in a nutshell, if rates were to continue to fall, we remain bullish on quality names with strong dividends. And we also like a lot low volatility stocks to better navigate through potential higher volatilities in the equity market. Right. So maybe expecting a little bit of volatility there. There's lots going on in the markets right now. We're heading to the U.S. election, which we've talk, been talking about a lot on the channel. Uh, so definitely expecting some volatility. But what are we seeing right now in the VIX? Uh, this is sort of Wall Street's fear gauge. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's right, Aaron. Like uh, lots of investors often look to the VIX as the level of fear in the market, meaning higher VIX, higher volatility. But do you know where VIX comes from and how it's calculated? So I'm, I'm going to try to un unpack that. Um, so for starters, VIX is an indicator of expected volatility from market participants. So who are these market participants, you may ask? Well, they are everyone who has access to the markets, such as hedge funds, uh, market makers, buy side, sell side, and also including self-directed investors. So every market participant will have a different view of expected volatility. So how do they cast their votes on market volatility? It's not like there's a voting system or website for this, right? <laughs> so in order to express their views, market participants are using XPX options. So these are index options. So they're taking the information that we are getting from the options market and we're able to convert those market sentiments into VIX levels. 
So whenever the VIX level or the market is high, option traders tend to demand for higher option premiums, which is normal. But here's the thing. Investors often relate volatility to risk, and this can sometimes be misleading. So what do I mean by that? So let's say, for example, if you have a stock that has a 20% volatility, it doesn't mean that the stock would go down by 20% because it can easily and also go the other way. So volatility is not directional. And in the market, there are two types of volatility. There's good volatility and also bad volatility. So when we talk about good volatility, this will bring opportunities to buy good stocks at a discount. And for bad volatility, that would bring downside risk. And that's what long-term investors try to avoid. But don't get me wrong, because high volatility stocks are great for day traders. So if you're a day trader, when you think about when the market corrects, you're buying the dip and then you try to sell the rally. So if you're a day trader, you're going to love volatile days. And that's why you see a lot more trading volume on exchanges. This is because the HFTs, uh, day traders, they're trying to capitalize on these crazy market movements. So they love it. It's paradise for them. But where, when it comes to low volatility stocks, this is generally good for long-term buy and hold investors. So in a nutshell, that's how you calculate VIX and that's where it comes from. So this is some you know great discussions to have with your friends and family the next time whenever the term VIX comes up during your <laughs> chats with your families and friends. I think that's one of the best explanations I've ever heard, Rich. So nicely done. Um, a lot of investors, you know, really fearing that downside volatility right now. And one popular trade that we've seen investors really pouring money into is that cash trade. So these are things like HISA ETFs or cash alternative products like, like a money market ETF, as an example. Walk us through what BMO has, if this is sort of the camp that you're sitting in, if you're looking to take money and put it on the sidelines, or if you're saving for a shorter term goal uh, in your investment journey, what are some sh of those shorter term options that investors can look at? Yeah, I mean, like the HESA trade for high interest savings account products, that was once a pretty popular trade for investors because investors who were looking for less risk, they can sit on the sideline and take in 5% risk-free, but that really has changed when OSFI implemented stricter liquidity requirements and guidelines on HESA ETFs and funds earlier this year. So we did see a drop in yield for HESA products, but the good thing is that the OSFI requirement didn't apply on fixed income and uh, money market ETFs. So this means that for investors, when they saw this announcement coming, they didn't make the change and switch over to, for example, ZST, which is BMO's ultra short term bond ETF, and even ZMMK for that matter, the BMO money market fund ETF. So guess what? In addition to a yield pickup, investors who are investing or buying these solutions in their taxable account, they're also benefiting from a more tax efficient solution by using ultra short term bond ETFs like ZST. So it's great for taxable accounts. And also um, this year, year to date, we're seeing lots of inflows going into ZST, ZMMK. So they're trying to get better yields. And also the other benefit of these products is that there's no lockup period like GICs and also being more tax efficient. So if you want to sit or you know, be on the sidelines because you think that the market is gonna be more volatile, so great places to park cash or shelter away from market volatility would be ZST or ZMMK. These are great ETFs to consider. All right, perfect. And always the good idea to check out our BMO ETFs tools. You can put our money market ETFs at MMK, up against any of the other cash alternative products or ZST and, and take a look at the yield comparables there. Um, so definitely short-term fixed income is one way to get out of the way of volatility. Um, but what, what do we really look at as some best practices when it comes, you know, especially for those investors who have a longer term view or longer term time horizon, uh, what are some best practices in order for them to, to deal with this volatility? 
Now, best practices would be trying to stay the course, stay invested, and also being diversified. These are very important key points when it comes to investments. And never try to time the market because timing the market is super difficult. And everybody who's invested in the market for quite some time know this. Timing the market is tough. But every investor is different, right? Because the time horizon and also your risk tolerance and my risk tolerances is not going to be the same for every investor. So for example, if you take a look on the screen, we have two investors, investor A and B. They each start with a $100,000 portfolio. And during the pandemic, one of them decides to parachute the market, exit, and re-enter a year later. Now, when we compare these two accounts today, there's going to be a huge gap a difference of a whopping amount of $275,000, sorry. So if you're a long-term investor, you should probably stay the course with a diversified portfolio. But if you're someone who is near retirement, that would probably be different. Therefore, asset allocation is very important and you need to reevaluate your investments, your objectives to see if you're still on track for your retirement needs. So looking for ways to reduce risk, to protect your savings is crucial. Perfect. Yeah, they're all good ideas. And my personal way of dealing with it is to just not look, to not look in my account very often. Uh, I find that helps with that whole psychology thing as well. Um, let's get into some additional ETF strategies that can help investors. I want to talk about low volatility ETFs because a lot of interest is coming up around these lately. How do these work? Yeah, so last week when, uh, when we were at the Money Show, every um, speaker were talking about low volatility ETFs, right? Because in the market, you can buy passive index funds and benefit from the broad market. But let's say you don't want to invest into the entire universe. You can start thinking about a factor ETF such as low vol because low vol ETFs, what they do is that they'll screen through the market for stocks that are less volatile, giving you a smoother journey, a smoother ride in your investments. So if you're the type of investor who doesn't have that risk appetite, or if you want to sleep better at night, a low vol ETF is really designed to minimize that volatility. Now, you might ask, like, how do we do this? So what do we do? So when it comes to low vol ETFs, we do this by selecting stocks that have a lower beta. So these names will typically have a lower beta and will have a lower sensitivity to the broad market. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're looking at company ABC and that the beta of ABC is 0 0.8. And now let's imagine that the market drops 10%. If all else is equal, ABC should drop less because it has a lower beta. Now, that being said, a low vol factor ETF is one of uh, a great way to get downside protection in a bearish market because they tend to outperform because they are holding defensive names and also invest in sectors that are more defensive, for example, utilities, consumer goods and services. For sure. And even if you look at ZLB or Demo Canadian low vol ETF, it holds zero energy right now, zero percent in energy. So. Uh, you can imagine that in some years that might hurt, but over the long run, it's it's really uh, provided some tailwind there. Um, and you know, speaking of that, usually when we think about uh, what we need to get more return, we think we need to take greater risk, right? We always say greater risk for greater return, but there's an anomaly with low volati volatility ETS where that's not necessarily the case. So walk us through the historical performance example here on how it doesn't necessarily mean you're giving up returns. Yeah, that's right. And because, uh, you know, that's one of the law of finances of risk and return. If you want higher returns, you got to take on more risk. And because in our low vol ETF, we're able to defy the laws of finance. Now you can get better risk adjusted returns, better long term performance with a lot less risk. So these are better solutions. And if you take a look at the screen here, you can see the blue line which is ZLB, BMO Low Vol Canadian Equity ETF, against the green line, which is the BMO S&P TSX Cap Composite Index ETF. 
So here you can see that ZLB is outperforming the broad market performance over the long term. And also the performance numbers on the right really shows how powerful this low vol mandate or low vol strategy can bring to the portfolio. And now if you look at the bottom of the screen, we can also observe the additional benefits of a low vol ETF because it's going to provide investors with a lower standard deviation, which is risk and also higher sharp ratios. So going back to what we said earlier, you don't need to accept lower potential returns for lower risk. So here with the uh, low vol ETF said that B or any other ETF that we have a low vol mandate, the three key takeaways is that you can get lower risk, higher sharp ratio, and also better performance over the long term. And this is what I like to call a trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. And we can't guarantee that that's going to continue. But with 10 years uh, track record, the historical performance definitely is, is shining there. Uh, what about investors who are you know, really focused on limiting the downside or who want a built-in cushion for their portfolios? There are ETFs out there that can help, uh, those being our new buffer ETFs. So walk us through the benefit of these strategies for investors. Yeah, absolutely. And especially this episode is all about reducing risk we have to talk about buffer ETFs because mm -hmm. they're great solutions to consider if you want to stay invested in the equity markets, in the stock market, but with some protection. So for instance, when you buy a car, you want to have all those security features like blind spot sensors, airbags, just in case of an accident. So a buffer is pretty much like that airbag feature. You know, when you buy your car, let's say if the market drops, Investors will be protected to a certain extent from market drawdowns. And these are like great solutions out there that can help limit downside risk. What's the reference asset or the underlying of these buffer ETFs at BMO? I'm happy that you ask because in our buffer ETFs, we are using our BMO S&P 500 hedge to CAD index ETF. The ticker symbol is ZUE. Okay, I like to call it ZUE. And Zui has two great benefits of having Zui in this structure. First is because it's currency hedge. So this means that you won't have to worry about any currency risk. And number two, because we are holding ZUE in our buffer ETFs, investors also receive dividends. And you know, BMO was the first ETF provider to use options inside an ETF wrapper. So essentially, we uh, took our options capabilities and expertise to the next level. And inside our buffer ETFs, we are using custom protective options to provide that downside. Now, if you take a look at the screen, you can see that we have a buffer ETF series for every quarter. The tickers are ZJAN, ZAPR, ZJUL and ZOCT. Each buffer ETF will have a one year outcome period. And after that one year outcome period, we simply reset those option protections for another year, just like how you do um, with your car insurance. So you renew them once a year, same thing with the buffer ETFs. So let's say if you want protection in the markets, buffer ETFs are here to help. So that will protect you against 15% downside protection against market losses if you buy them on day one. And if you, let's say, didn't get the chance to buy them on day one, don't worry because you can also wait for the next quarter reset or even look on our website for the metrics of the remaining buffer and caps. We have our first annual reset coming up on uh, October 1st with ZOCT. So look out for that where there'll be a new uh, buffer and cap zone. Um, but Rich, maybe we should stop there and talk about the caps because there is a trade-off with these strategies in order to pay for the downside protection, there is a cap on the upside. So talk to us about the caps and how and how and when sort of that comes into play. Sure, Aaron. As you know, buying protection is never fun because you have to pay for it, but we need to have it. You know, it's just like buying car insurance. If you need it, you need to have it there and you're gonna need it when you need it the most. So same thing for investments. When you are thinking about your investments, 
you always have to keep in mind to ensure some type of proper risk management. So in our Buffett ETFs, to provide that 15% downside protection at no cost. Yes, you heard that right. That's at no cost. How do we, how do we uh, achieve this insurance or protection at no cost is because we are using OPM. <laughs> OPM, for those who don't know, this is other people's money. So we're essentially subsidizing the protection by writing call options on ZUE. Now, whenever we write call options, we are essentially using the option premium that we collect to pay for the protection. So it's very well designed. And because of that, we're able to get a cap that is pretty interesting. The cap level so far with our buffer ETFs is somewhere between 9 to 10%. So you have a potential cap on the upside between that, you know, nine to ten percent, which is still very interesting in a year where the market is flat or you know not generating that much uh, returns. So that's why, like, when it comes to a buffer ETF, it makes a lot of sense when you want to get that potential upside, but also making sure that your capital is uh, protected. And that's how you get that trade-off. So that trade-off is also what we call the structured outcome solutions, because you know exactly what to expect if the market mm -hmm. is going to go up or down. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And walk us through some scenarios in terms of what we can expect in a buffer ETF if the market's up or down at expiry. Ah, sure. So. Let's uh, refer to the chart that you see on the screen. Let's start with the left-hand side. Right there, you see the dark blue bar. That is the reference asset, ZUE. And then the light blue bar is the buffer ETF. So let's imagine that the market experiences a sharp uh, decline of 40%, something similar to the 08-09 crisis. The buffer ETF will be down 15% less, so being 25% loss versus 40 and next, let's say the market were to drop 15%, the buffer ETF will have no losses. Now, on the other side, let's say the market were to be up 4%, the buffer ETF will have the same market performance as the reference ETF ZUE. Now, in a market situation or scenario where the market, let's say, um, is up 12%, which is above the upside cap, the buffer will make 100% of the 10% cap. So in this situation, the investor is able to benefit from the upside up to the cap and also have some type of protection on the downside. And uh, one more thing to mention here, because inside our buffer ETF structure, since we're holding ZUE, the buffer um, investors will also be earning the dividends, which means that the investor, let's say in scenario four, when the market is above the cap, the investor will make 100% of the 10% cap plus the dividends, which is in the S&P 500 right now between one to 1.1%. 1 .1%. So that is an extra yield that goes into the investment. So the structure is really well designed and it's mm -hmm. a great solution to consider if you want to mitigate that equity risk. For sure. And we've seen these just skyrocket in popularity south of the border in the US. And, you know, I think what we've done a theme a year ago is bring this to Canadians as well for a product that's specifically for Canadians. So very excited about these products. Thank you so much, Rich, for joining me today and for all your uh, great insights around strategies investors can use to, to lower volatility in their portfolio. We talked about cash alternatives. We talked about low volatility, buffer ETFs. Um, you touched on gold. Um, we did do an episode last week, so I, I encourage everybody who missed that to watch that um, in order to learn a bit more about all the reasons why gold might be a good place to, to park some money right now. Um, but thanks again, Rich. I, I really hope to have you back again soon. Oh, nice gold bar there. I know. We're here. ZGLD. There you go. The most Thank gold you for having me. Thanks, Rich. And thanks to our viewers for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe 
and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at ETFMarketInsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.